Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. And uh, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm an architect by trade. And I'm responsible for one part of the archaeological park, which is everything to do with architecture but also with presentation and so I would like to talk about the experiences of the last 40 years of communicating scholarly results uh, at the Elf our Archaeological Park at Xanten to a wider audience. Now the Archaeological Park is located some hundred kilometers north of Cologne at the banks of the River Rhine. It used to be a major colonia in Roman times and uh, part of what I'm doing is how we get the message across. And the Inamis Charter, in its preamble, actually states it, uh, they, which is the people deciding on the Inamis Charter, they implicitly acknowledge that every act of heritage conservation within all the world's cultural traditions is by its nature a communicative act. So we talk about how to get the message across. Now, communication means there are a number, a series of transitional processes. So from the fact at the very beginning to what's ending up in the mind, of the person visiting a site. And the first transformation process is actually that we have facts. I know there's a discussion going on in archaeology about facts or non-facts, but uh, we have facts, we have some skeletons, we have some masonry, we have some pottery uh, in the ground. And then the scholar looks at it, and there's a filter in between, which is the mind of the scholar, which is his pre-existing knowledge which is his experience, his background, the way he looks at things. And depending on what he knows or he doesn't know, he can make a lot of what he's actually looking at, or he can make less of it. Now, these things change through time. hundred years ago, this was a perception what actually happened in Roman baths. So it was Aymatadema and Goodwood. They had some ideas of sets life in a Roman bath. Now, hundred years later, my predecessor reconstructed a hostel bath at Xanten, and it looks much more sober. It's still mm -hmm. colorful, but it looks much more sober than what Gutwart and Alma Tadema have been talking about. Now, it's not just changing throughout time. It's also that different scholars may look at the same thing in a different way. 2007 to 2014, I did a reconstruction project of three, three craftsmen houses at the Archaeological Park. And when we came up to the point of deciding on the interior decoration scheme, I asked two scholars to do a design proposal how we should paint the walls. And I ended up with asking two people, Britta Janssen and Michael Zelle, these are the two people over here, they together had done a lot of research on wall paintings from Xanten. They've been looking in the same boxes. They've been working alongside each other for years. They've been publishing a major volume on Roman war painting at Xanten. And when they came up with a design scheme, Britta Janssen came up with a design scheme, which is a whitewashed wall with very small red and black lines, which is the cheapest possible way in Roman times to do wall paintings. It's iron oxide, rust, and it's suit, the two cheapest pigments used in wall paintings. Uh, while Michael, Michael Zelle ended up with a very colorful scheme you see on the right side. Now, fact is that from the very excavation side, we have hardly any information. So both of the scholars said we have to fill in the gaps with some information from another side. And they came up with a different idea, which as a side they should actually take in consideration for deciding on a design scheme. Now, how much you may actually be influenced by what you see day by day without ever realizing that this is influencing you, this is reconstruction by Ralph Eggers on Vindonissa. Now, you see the porticos, you see the street, and you see Roman houses behind the porticos. And just 15 minutes outside of Vindonissa, <laughs> you pass this building, <laughs> and suddenly you come up with, how did he came up with this idea how Roman houses may have looked like? So, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe put it this way, you only see what you know. And this has a double meaning. If you don't know anything about what you're looking at, you may overlook something that's there. But on the other hand, if you know exactly what you're going to find, you may also overlook something that's there. Now, once you have an idea in the mind of the scholar what he's actually looking at, then he needs to use some media to get the message across. This could be reconstruction drawings, could be 
visualization, full scale reconstruction, computer modeling, text, lectures, whatsoever. But in between, there's once again a filter, which are financial restrictions, limited skills, lack of knowledge, verbal inaccuracies, lack of time, conservation aspects, building regulations, all these sort of things. Another example is, this is a prevailing conservation attitude from the late 1940s, in the 1950s, early 1960s. The Alte Pinakothek in München. This building was damaged in World War II, the center part was missing. So, Following the conservation ethics at this point of time, you fill in the missing pit bits in order to have a still functional building. And the main structure is still there, but the detailing that's missing. So you don't have the semicircular columns between the windows and all the detailing is missing, it's just plain brickwork. Now following this conservation idea, my predecessor Gundolf Brecht, he said, the limitations of reconstruction based upon excavated archaeological remains are dictated by the scant knowledge of the superstructure, which obliges one to careful abstraction and the renunciation of all detailing. So he was a scholar of this conservation attitude, which was common standard at this point of time, which ended up with his reconstruction of the Harbour Gate Hafentor. You see now? that we know the width of the gate, because the two stone blocks you see at the base, they have been found on site. But we didn't find a single voisoir, no stone from the arch. So he said, if we don't know the detailing of this arch, we just do plain stones. No details whatsoever. To be honest, we should expect something like this. Of course we don't know the exact detailing, but we know from a lot of Roman arches, this is the sort of arch we should expect in one or the other way at such a gate. Now, I certainly do not claim that my predecessors were anywhere close to Nazi architecture. But this is the Reichsparteitag Gelände Nürnberg. And you suddenly realize that there's a certain monumentality, a certain plain facade, a certain straightforward idea of massive building, and a visitor passing the building not being educated in architectural history, not being educated in Roman archaeology, he just takes in an image which is wrong, which is certainly wrong, but is just the result of a conservation attitude which was correct. Now another example. Out of the entire area of the Roman city, we've just excavated some 15 to 18 percent to date. All the blank spaces are not excavated so far. How are we going to communicate this? The first reconstruction drawings done in 1973 actually show this is what we know and that's what we don't know. And the first scale model that was built to be presented to the public was made in the same way, ending up with our visitors asking why did the Romans build such a large defensive wall if they don't have any head in there? Now, uh, one of the first computer-generated models done by the University of Dortmund, it just reconstructed one of the insula and then it multiplied to cover the entire area of the city with these insula. So give an idea of a densely built-up area, which is very uh, strange in a way, but most of the people now understood this is densely built-up. And now unhappy with this uh, uniform appearance, our draftsperson within our team, he came up with this handmade uh, image of the Roman city, which is more colorful, it has tiled roofs and slate roofs and some spaces in between, not built up, uh, which was an image we used for quite a long time. And uh, a most recent computer-generated model, which was more vivid, more differentiated, but still not based on facts. And the model I love most is actually this one. When we decided to have everything we don't know, but we just assume that all these insulae are being built up with houses, we do in white color. And where we actually have excavation results and we can do a statement on what has been there, we do in colored reconstructed houses in this model. So this helps in communicating, saying, okay, this is the idea of a completely densely built up city, but only the colored bits we really know. Now, another problem that may happen when my predecessor 
reconstructed the uh, bars at a hospital at Xanten that he had to recreate a basin that works, that contains water, and not knowing how to do it, there were two possibilities. Asking the producer of swimming pool paint, he got two colors available, which was light blue, you all know, and red. Uh, deciding that light blue is worse than red, he came up with the red swimming pool color available on the market. And in Secretuno, at the end of Hadrian, um, Hadrian's Wall in England, they came to our side to look at how we done it, and they copied, of course, this red color. And also added some glass panels for health and safety regulations. <laughs> in reconstructing the Craftsman's buildings, the planning permission asked us to have a door between two individual houses within the reconstruction compound. And uh, for fire regulations that you have two stairs available in case of one of the stairs being blocked by fire. Now, the idea we came up with was painting this doorway in a gray color and adding a sign saying in three languages, this is a modern passage, necessary for fire escape route, didn't exist in Roman times. And this is color scheme, the uh, color scheme we do in the entire archaeological park by now, that everything that's new doesn't have any colors. It's black, it's white, it's gray, or shades of gray, and uh, zinc metal, concrete, and everything that's with color actually represents something Roman. Now, once you get all your ideas into a message, there's a visitor who takes on this message and needs to create an image in his mind. And once again, there is a filter in between his the knowledge, the pre-existing knowledge, the experience in the background of the visitor. And if you say house, it doesn't necessarily mean that all your visitors have the same idea as you actually wanted to put into this work. One of the uh, examples I would like to show you is there's a stair going down to a basement room. And for health and safety regulations, we had to fit in a rail to prevent people from falling down the stairs. So my predecessor said, how am I going to fix this wooden rail to the column, not knowing how to do it? He came up with an idea, which is from garden technology, that you have a U-shaped metal brace and a circular pin. Usually you take it in the garden using some wooden elements uh, to prevent the water soaking up. And uh, he said, obviously, this is modern. Everyone will recognize this as a modern added element. When I came up to a toy fair, looking at a scale model of this Roman officer, and uh, I, I, I was just passing by, stopped, and said, well, why, why did you do it? And he said, well, well, you know, I, I went to the archaeological park and something, they did it, and so it must be Roman. <laughs> so, talking to people, trying to get the message across, there's so many pitfalls on the way where you can actually go wrong. So it's difficult to show what you know, and it's even more difficult to show what you do not know. And um, this is one of the tasks we're discussing every day anew in the archaeological park. In an ever-changing society, in ever-changing media consumption with young people nowadays, how do we actually get the message across? And we do work on this topic day for day, eight hours, ten hours, whatsoever. So to us, everything is logical, everything is clear, everything is obvious. To them, it's not. And trying to get a common language to communicate is quite an effort. Well, thank you very much for your attention.